you can transfer a, a radio wave through it or x-rays or uh, light. Again, you need a medium for a wave to pass through. You cannot have a perfect vacuum. Okay. Where did that expression, nature abhors a vacuum, come from? <laughs> <laughs> I like it, uh, but where did it come from? That's just one of those glib statements that if there is uh, a vacuum somewhere, then uh, the surrounding material will try and rush in to fill the space. <laughs> Do you accept that? Uh, well, insofar as it's, uh, you know, you can apply it in space, for instance. Um, it has fairly limited use. I wouldn't use it as a, um, uh, a paradigm. <laughs> okay. Because I maintain that sometimes when you ask a question and you hold the question, you create mm -hmm. a vacuum for the answer to come rushing in. Yeah, I think that's also known as the law of attraction. I don't know about that, but this is something I thought about like 25 years ago. Yeah. And I noticed every time I ask the question and hold the question, things come in. That is known as the law of attraction. In other words... It is? Yeah. They don't teach you how it's, to ask questions. <laughs> no, uh, but um, it's a case of the universe. If we're connected to the rest of the universe yeah. instantly, right. then anything that goes on in our mind is also uh, accessible to right. the rest of the universe. Right. And that means we're all connected. Everyone's connected. So if you have a question in your mind, then it's sitting out there looking for <laughs> there, there is an answer somewhere. Right. If there is an answer somewhere, then there's a good chance that you're in a state to receive it. I didn't know that was called the law of attraction. I thought it was something else. No, it's a bit like being tuned to the right radio station. You won't hear yeah. it unless you tuned in. Did you study the law of attraction? I have looked at that because that fits with the electric universe model of uh, Indeed. You know, Indeed. life and biological interactions. It also helps understand the mind-body connection. I found it very palatable to people who had never talked about and considered manifestation. I ran around with a question for... 25 years how to expedite the financing of solutions and discoveries around the world mm -hmm. and took me all over the world to get some of the information on how that would be done mm -hmm. very interesting journey yeah well that's a similar story for me um my interest in this began when i was um in primary and secondary school and uh, a book i read a book um when i was at high school uh, by emmanuel velikovsky Worlds in Collision. It was a bestseller on the New York um, uh, Times bestseller list in 1950. And uh, that opened my eyes to a way of doing science which is more based on the um, police investigation style, you know, the forensic evidence, where you take evidence from a whole lot of unreliable witnesses and try and figure out what actually happened. And uh, it was from that that I learnt that, uh, well, I thought Velikovsky, the author of the book, had um, made a very good case for the solar system having recently undergone um, catastrophes, you know, and the Earth having been involved in it. But it's taken decades to actually get the hard evidence to show that this is true, even though there was strong circumstantial evidence at the time. But now we have the um, kind of evidence that would hold up in court, I think. And this is, if you think about it, a lot of uh, scientific theories that are put out uh, would never stand up in court <laughs> if they were subjected to the same kind of cross-examination. So I feel fairly confident that we're on the right track with that. And that introduced me to the idea that the ancients talked about the thunderbolt, the cosmic thunderbolt, the thunderbolt of the gods having been involved in these interactions between planets which came very close to one another. In other words, the solar system as we see it today is not the one that our uh, forebears witnessed. All of these things were very unsettling at the time, but um, they opened the way to understanding the universe as it really is, and not as we would wish it to be, uh, which is a stable, clockwork, Newtonian, gravitational system. It's not. When you talked about the sun, you also mm -hmm. said that the sun is nothing like what we think it is. That's right. It's something totally different. Share that with us. Well, we look at the great uh, shining ball in the sky and we're told that all of that heat and light comes from something going on at the center of the sun. For that to be true, the sun has to be a body unlike any other body that we know. Uh, it means that the uh, lethal radiation from a nuclear thermonuclear reactor at the center of each star has to somehow be broken down into radiation which is benign for life, you know, the heat and light, instead of X-rays and gamma rays and uh, nuclear radiation of that description. And that requires a body that 
transfers um, heat and light and so on internally in the form of radiation. Well, we know of no other body like that. The other thing is that when you look at the sun, all of the things that are happening in plain view uh, suggest that that model is incorrect. But because we've been brought up with that idea for more than 100 years, uh, and uh, we, I can understand why that is, but we've been given that story for 100 years or more, it's very hard to break away from that story because people think you're crazy. Is it electromagnetic? The sun is like uh, a kind of electric light in the sky. The surface, so-called surface of the sun, the glowing uh, sphere that we see, has all of the characteristics of a, an arc discharge, the kind that they used to use in searchlights. And... Um, <clears throat> The, the, all of the effects we see, the flares, the uh, magnetic field, which is quite strange, the mag magnetic field on the sun, can all be explained if the sun is acting like uh, an electric discharge phenomenon. So what we're looking at in the sky is uh, virtually a ball of lightning, where each lightning bolt is in the form of a huge electric tornado, packed close, close packed, so that you get that granular effect when you look at it very closely. And occasionally it has outbursts, electrical outbursts, and it shoots material, you know, billions of tons of material out into space. Now, you can't do that with gravity, and there's no explanation for it in terms of a nuclear reactor at the centre of the sun. And if it was a nuclear reactor at the centre of the sun, we should expect stars to be going off like the 4th of July, because it's a very unstable model. It's one which tends to um, uh, destruct rather than to exist peacefully for billions of years. And what does this translation mean to science? Well, it's <laughs> the complete theory. When you think about cosmology, cosmology, as I said, is supposed to be our story of our existence in the universe, which means you have to understand uh, the biology, uh, the formation of the Earth, the formation of the solar system, the formation of galaxies. All of these things are still huge problems for the Big Bang Theory. And uh, the Big Bang Theory has absolutely nothing really sensible to say about any of them. If you have the correct cosmology, there can be no exceptions in any discipline. You can ask a question in any discipline you can think of. It can be um, uh, to do with religion. It can be do to do with uh, the history of the human race, uh, geology, paleontology, um, geology, anything you like to name. There has to be an answer. It has to be connected to the cosmology because that's the overarching big picture. Now, the Big Bang has nothing useful to say about any of these things. Uh, the electric universe, on the other hand, takes the evidence from geology, archaeology, religion, um, all of these things I've mentioned, and they all come together. So this picture doesn't have huge gaping holes in it. And that's, I think, where it has a big appeal to people who, who are casting around for answers. Uh, and it's also a very hopeful story because it places us as an integral part of the entire universe instead of the Big Bang where everything's flying apart, it's winding down, it's all going to end up in either a heat death as they call it or a big crunch when it all comes back together again. This is a completely hopeless cosmology and I can understand why um, people feel there is no answers for them in science. And so that we busy ourselves with um, our activities. Our, our children are turned off from science because it doesn't seem to offer any use, useful um, information for them about life and our existence. All of these things, I think, can be turned right around once we get the cosmology right. You say that quantum theory and relativity theory are incompatible. Yes. Why? Explain it. Well, they're both at the heart of the Big Bang cosmology, of course. Uh, I asked you a little question. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, as I said before, quantum theory is a set of mathematical descriptions of how matter operates at the subatomic level. And uh, it's not supposed to work at anything other than the subatomic level. And it it's been a real problem for scientists trying to figure out why is the why does the world look the way it does when when you get down to the quantum world it's weird you know things happen that shouldn't happen according to a common sense view of the way things are supposed to work 
And then at the other end of the scale, you've got Einstein's theory, which is applied on the grand scale of gravity and the universe and, and uh, gravity.